The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Hi, this is Benjamin from the UK true crime podcast, They Walk Among Us. Brought to you by AMC Networks, Shudder is a premium streaming experience that provides a multi-sensory dive into fantastical worlds, offering the very best of old and new horror. Discover films and series that covers the entire horror spectrum, including highly anticipated new releases like The Boy Behind the Door and Psycho Gorman, to giants of the horror genre like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween. What's more, you can watch one of my all-time favourite films, Mandy. A spiralling, surreal, bloody journey of revenge, with visuals that are simply mind-blowing. Exceptional originals, movies, TV series and live events, there's always something new and unexpected for Shudder members to experience. Sign up at Shudder.com. I'm Rukini Krupp, and this is an episode from the Lawfare Archive for September 5th, 2021. The chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan that unfolded over the past weeks has spurred a series of debates over the withdrawal strategy, U.S. involvement in the country, and the role of the U.S. military worldwide. Part of those debates include questions about U.S. civil-military relations. For today's podcast, I chose an episode from February 2018. In this episode, Jack Goldsmith sat down with Phil Carter, to talk about the history of civil-military relations, the Trump administration's departure from that tradition, and what the future might hold. I'm Matthew Kahn, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, February 20th, 2018. The Trump administration has been marked by the norms it has shattered. In that regard, the military has been no exception. To discuss the ways that the Trump administration may be challenging civil-military relations, Lawfare co-founder Jack Goldsmith had a conversation with Phil Carter, a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. They talked about the history of civil-military relations, episodes that illustrate the Trump administration's departure from those norms, and what it might mean for the future. It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode 285, Phil Carter on civil-military relations in the Trump administration. So, Phil, I want to start off with um, a quote from the article you wrote, the op-ed you wrote in the New York Times on February 8th, the second paragraph of that op-ed, which I think frames what we're going to talk about today well. Here's what you wrote. Some of the most important constraints on presidential power have been shaped in the form of norms of civil military relations observed from George Washington to Barack Obama. These norms, respect for the military's culture, its role in society and its separation from partisan politics have been bolstered in recent decades by a professional military ethic that requires troops to avoid politics and focus on their missions. So that's a nice statement of um, sort of how we think about civil military relations. And I think before we start talking about how President Trump has violated norms in this regard, let's set the background. So just can you just walk us through how and why, how the United States has thought about civil military relations since the founding, just a thumbnail sketch? Sure, and thanks for having me on, Jack. The, uh, the best thing to start with is always a great quote, like, in the beginning, and in this case, I think it's appropriate. You know, in, in the beginning of the Republic, there were civil military frictions, but they were very different because we had an amateur military that served in wartime uh, that is comprised of volunteers who served in wartime, and then a very small military estimate that existed between wars. And we didn't have a large standing military until the Second World War. During the first 150 years or so of America's history, we had this small peacetime military that would expand very rapidly during wartime through conscription or through the use of volunteers. And you had a lot of civil military friction during wartime. The Civil War is probably the greatest example with the clashes between General McClellan 
McClellan and President Lincoln as a, as a great case study, but the kind of persistent civil-military relations we see today didn't emerge until the Second World War. The Second World War gives us a very large military. At the height of that war, we had 16 million men and women serving in uniform. At the end of that war, we get the National Security Act of 1947, which gives us the national security architecture we have today of a Defense Department, a CIA, an NSC, and the other agencies, and essentially the same set pieces where they sit today. And it's this permanent standing military that creates the landscape for civil military relations, as well as the changes in the world, the advent of nuclear weapons, the need for a president who can take the country to war literally within minutes at the push of a button, and the advent of uh, global transportation means that allow war to come to the United States much faster, uh, rendering moot some of the checks and balances in the Constitution, such as the Declare War Clause, or arguably rendering those moot. So, so that's the landscape that gives us civil military relations today, a very large standing military establishment, a president who sits atop that establishment as the commander in chief of the armed forces in charge of 2.4 million or so service members uh, and a very large defense and intelligence community behind them. And this professionalized class of generals uh, who lead that military. So for, before we get to the what President Trump has done, can you tell us about what the worry is? I mean, what is the worry about having a permanent standing army? And how has the United States dealt with this problem, which has been an issue since 1945 or 1950 and around there until President Trump became president? So what the norms you talked about um, in the op-ed piece, what, what problems were they addressing and how did they address them? So the main norm that's come into being is one within the military, which is that the military should avoid politics. It's something that George Marshall embodied when he was the, the chief of staff of the Army, and it's one the military really embraced uh, through the works of political scientist Sam Huntington, and this idea that the military would focus itself on tactics, to some extent strategy, but leave the decisions on strategy and political aims to the civilians who control them. And civilian control means the civilian, the ultimate civilian is the commander in chief, his or her secretary of defense is next in line as, as the number two in the chain of command, and all uniformed personnel report to that person. They have the right to tell the military what to do, they have the right to be wrong, and the military will only go so far in uh, in speaking back to them and also not get involved in partisan politics or domestic politics with respect to selection of objectives, nudging for policies they feel are advantageous, uh, arguing for budget share, and so forth. Many of these norms have eroded over time. The, the, the principles still remain as important parts of the military ethos. Yeah, so I was going to ask you that. It seems like all of those ideals are recognized as ideals and have been recognized as ideals since and probably before World War II, but certainly since afterwards. But they haven't, they've been sometimes honored in the breach, I take it, at the margins. Sometimes the military seemed to be pushing back in, in areas where it shouldn't be pushing back. Sometimes it seemed been seen to have too much authority. Can you just tell us in general how the reality of that ideal worked out for that time? So the reality is that there's much more of a dialogue that exists than a one-way communication flow. The president just doesn't hand down orders uh, like Zeus at Mount Olympus. There's a dialogue between the president and senior military leaders that takes place in the Situation Room, and and this can often be quite contentious, whether it's the president arguing with generals over how many troops it will take in the Iraq War, or more recently, President Trump arguing with his generals over whether or not we should be in Afghanistan at all, and if so, should we increase the troop count there by 5,000? or 10,000 or some other number. Uh, these debates have been very contentious and they typically break down um, along institutional lines. Uh, often the Defense Department and the Intelligence Committee will line up against uh, the State Department or other agencies and the White House is, is oftentimes left to referee these battles over foreign policy aims or national security aims uh, between their agencies. So that sounds like a fair description to me, and it sounds like you know bureaucratic politics as applied to the military. Uh, I have to say that my short time in the Pentagon, you know, I saw some of that, but I also saw, at least in my experience, tell me if this is true, that even these bureaucratic battles, even when the DOD uh, really cared about something and was throwing its weight around to try to get it from the civilians or try to win, it, win its way, the ideals you talked about still set boundaries, still informed how the negotiations took place, still uh, informed the relationship. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, 
That's right. There are certain boundaries that matter more than others. One of the more important ones is is having the military not get involved on domestic political issues. Admiral Michael Mullen, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, made a lot of waves when he waded into the debate over the national debt and said that he saw the debt as a national security issue. He may well have been right, but it marked a real departure for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs to start talking about domestic economic policy as an element of national security. Generally, the service chiefs stay out of debates over the economy, health care, education, and so forth, even though these things clearly have an impact on recruiting and uh, the readiness of the force in the aggregate, because we normatively don't want the military to become just another interest group. We don't want them distracted from their warfighting missions. And I think we have a certain aversion to having uh, essentially an armed interest group that can throw its weight around in domestic politics. Of course. And so last question before we get to President Trump, and that is, we've just been talking about the military side of compliance with the norm. How about the presidential side? You acknowledged it in your op-ed that the past seven presidents before President Trump have at least to some degree watered down the norms we've been talking about. That's right. So during presidential campaigns, going back to Bill Clinton, each successive cycle has tried to weaponize generals and admirals to deploy them and their endorsements as a way of validating the candidate on the issue of national security. And that has carried forward somewhat into office with the use of military audiences uh, as backdrops for major national security speeches. That said, there have been boundaries there too. Presidents Bush and Obama as wartime presidents were always very careful not to politicize visits to Walter Reed, for example, the hospital where wounded soldiers and, and other service members are. Um, and there are other boundaries that they put in place uh, as, as customs of the office and as rules of decorum. All right. Finally, that brings us to President Trump. And you have, more than anybody else who's writing about these issues, have for over a year now been documenting the extent to which President Trump has disregarded the norms we've just discussed. So why don't we just march through some of the highlights of these norm violations? I'd almost start the clock right at the inauguration um, with... uh about a week into his term, President Trump ordered a very risky raid in Yemen to uh, go after al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula there. And that raid went poorly, as these things often do or sometimes do. Uh, when the reports of that raid came out, rather than take ownership and say, the buck stops here, I support my generals, that we made a risky call, it was the right thing to do, President Trump blamed his generals for that raid and said, I, I only ordered it because they told me it would work. And you know, right there, you had a clear cut case of president abandoning a norm of civil military relations, which has been true since Harry Truman uh, and the famous sign on his desk, which said the buck stops here. Uh, president Trump pushed blame down instead of accepting blame at his level for a raid that he approved. And in doing so, signaled to both the troops and society that uh, he would not necessarily take responsibility for things that happened on his watch. What signal does that send? on the first or second or third day of the presidency to the troops and to the generals? It, it certainly signals that they should be cautious, that they should recommend actions that they feel very comfortable with. It may heighten risk aversion among senior military leaders who will only bring options to the president that they feel very comfortable with, knowing that he will not back them up if something goes wrong. Um, it also suggests that the Pentagon leadership may overdo its request for resources. That's something the Pentagon excels in anyway. They always ask for more troops than they need. But uh, in things like special operations and intelligence work, that can lead to missions simply being scrubbed or different models of missions being chosen. For example, sending a drone instead of a special operations team for a particular type of raid. The, the second instance of norm breaking, if you will, grows out of this first one. The Yemen raid leads to a Navy SEAL being killed in action. His wife attends Trump's first State of the Union in February 2017. At that address, Trump looks to her in the gallery, praises her, asks for a standing ovation, and gets it. And and in this moment, it's said that he becomes presidential. But that's not good enough. Trump goes a little bit too far and arguably appropriates her valor for political purposes, his political purposes. He then makes this mistake at several occasions during the next year when he has the opportunity to comfort the grieving widow of an army special forces soldier killed in Niger, he fumbles it. His chief of staff subsequently fumbles that. These kinds of ceremonial outreach functions, the outreach to a grieving widow, the, the, the salute to another grieving widow at the State of the Union, they're small and they're not policy oriented, but they really matter to the troops and their families. And they send a signal about how much the president cares about the men and women he sends into harm's way. So I'd say that's a second breach of civil military norms that we've seen under Trump. And that norm too, seems to be one that the threat is less of that region of norm of the military going too powerful than it is of the 
president losing the confidence of the military. Is that right? That's right. This really goes to his or her duty as commander in chief. And that, that term is is freighted with a great deal of meaning within the military. A commander doesn't just command troops. He or she must lead them and inspire respect and confidence. It's something that President Trump has not yet shown, his ability to, to connect with people and to inspire trust and confidence in those he leads. What is the impact? Can you generalize about the impact? When the president appropriates valor, as you say, how does that play in the Pentagon? It plays poorly and it creates a kind of resentment that honestly, I don't think we've seen as much since Bill Clinton was president. When Bill Clinton was president in the 90s, you would hear a frequent refrain, particularly during his investigation and subsequent impeachment proceedings about how Bill Clinton didn't live by the same code that the military did. That is that he had committed acts for which a military person would have been subject to military justice action or disciplinary action in his um, personal life. There is some of the same chatter today about President Trump, that in his personal life, in his business dealings, and in his personal and professional statements to date, he's not conducted himself as befitting a commander-in-chief. That shouldn't matter. Our military should work for a president regardless of who he or she is. But it does matter because uh, American troops, assisting from other countries' troops, want to be led, not just commanded. It, it, it at some point becomes corrosive of the civil military relationship when there is this disrespect coming up from below based on a president's personal conduct. Let's move to a different topic, and that is one that received a lot of attention early in the administration that we've just become used to it, I think, and that is the appointment in so many important civilian national security positions of generals. Can you just summarize what happened and tell us what the problem might be? Sure. So at the start of the Trump administration, they had appointed a number of senior retired generals to senior positions. John Kelly was at DHS, Jim Mattis was at the Pentagon, and Mike Flynn was national security advisor. Um, then there were some other former officers who were not generals, but who had a, a fair amount of military experience, like among Mike Pompeo at CIA and uh, Jeff Sessions at Justice. Um, and then a number of the NSC staffers that Mike Flynn brought with him were uh, retired colonels or retired senior officers from various branches of the military. Um, this matters to some extent. Uh, if, if national security decisions tend to be made by very small groups of people in secure basements of the White House, uh, it matters who the people are and it matters what their worldviews are and what their experiences are. And so if all the people around the table have a similar background and similar frame of reference that can bias decisions or create uh, groupthink. Uh, there's a bigger concern, though, that we raised in a, in a piece that I wrote with my CNAS colleague, Lauren Shulman, in November of 2016, which is that this can begin to work backwards and politicize the military. That is that when lots of senior officers are appointed by a president to political posts, uh, and in some cases when active officers can serve in those posts like H.R. McMaster does today as National Security Advisor, the perception emerges that the military itself has become politicized and that there are Democratic generals and there are Republican generals and that the generals who are working for Donald Trump are the Republican generals and the Democratic generals are the ones who didn't get selected or who were selected by the last team. And that can be very corrosive. That can also undermine the civil military relationship and the trust that needs to exist between uh, individuals of both parties um, when they're working together across administrations on important policies. So that all makes sense. I guess one question is, I mean, it's easy to understand uh, the point you just made, and it's easy to understand why we wouldn't want the civilian national security establishment to be dominated or to be populated with former generals for the reasons you stated. Is this an instance where we should have an exception to the rule, but precisely because President Trump is so inexperienced because his foreign policy and national security staff otherwise, at least on the campaign, was weak because these generals bring an element of stability to American foreign policy and continuity that might have been lacking. How do you weigh those trade-offs? That's a great question. And, and remember, a lot of this is driven by the Trump campaign's refusal to bring in political appointees that were not on their side during the bruising Republican primary or general election. So the, the so-called never Trumpers are more anathema to the Trump administration, even than Clinton supporters at this point, 
and that makes it very difficult for them to find potential political appointees. I think the second thing that is important here is that the the Trump administration needs people um, that can actually get through a confirmation process, a clearance process, and other staffing processes. And retired officers have been through those processes at some point in their careers or something similar to them so they can make it through. Those practical considerations aside, though, I think I worry about this use of the military as a political talent pool. You know, I'm a veteran. I served in the Army for nearly 10 years. I think there are lots of things veterans can and should do in society. But civilian control of the military is premised on this idea that um, civilians will look at not just military considerations in their decision making, but also political ones and, and things that are more appropriate for civilian political appointees con to consider. I think there's a real risk with putting active officers like H.R. McMaster in this role. There's, a, there's also latent risk of politicizing the military when you put recently retired generals in. You know, whether Jim Mattis is going to save the Republic or not in his current role, I think is a good question. But the choice is not just between putting a general or not in that role. There are lots of other qualified people who can serve in these roles, and, and the Trump administration ought to be looking to some of them as well. Right, but they just don't seem willing to do that. I think it's fair to say that the bulk of the conservative or Republican national security establishment simply refused to – to be, you know, at least on the campaign, they said that they weren't interested and they were against Trump. And then some of them became more interested after he won the presidency, but then the Trump team just seemed completely uninterested. So in that light, given that there's very little uh, talent, I mean, was it was it wrong for Mattis and Kelly and McMaster to take these jobs? Would you go that far or would you just say that it's unfortunate? I don't think it was wrong any more than it was wrong for Colin Powell to serve as George Bush's secretary of state. I think it just gives you a certain flavor on your team. And, and you know, I also think service is a, a noble calling. And so if you president asks you to serve, then then generally you do so. So I respect these people for what they're doing. I think one dynamic that is really underappreciated here is the extent to which this totally tilts the balance within the Pentagon itself. So within the Pentagon, nearly every decision or every staff process has a dual turnkey where there is a joint staff representative and a representative from the office of the secretary, a military and a civilian at every single meeting, at every single step of the process. When there are no civilian political appointees, as is often the case now, because the Trump administration has been so bad about appointments. The military essentially runs the table. And when there are civilian appointees who are essentially recently retired and still maybe wearing their uniform a little bit underneath their suit, that also tilts the balance. And so what we've seen in the Pentagon is a complete disempowerment of the Secretary of Defense's civilian staff and a super empowerment of the Joint Staff and the combatant commands like Central Command or NATO and European Command. That will live on beyond Trump. It will take some time to, to write that balance uh, within the Pentagon. And, and that has consequences in terms of options generation and budget preparation and strategy that will live on for many years. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device slash service required. Visit at and tcom slash active armor for details. Hi, this is Trace from the Horror Queers podcast. Shudder is the ultimate streaming service for fans of horror, thrillers, and the supernatural. Shudder offers an unbeatable selection from Hollywood favorites and cult classics to original series and critically acclaimed new genre films you won't find anywhere else. Explore the best collection of horror that pushes boundaries, showcases bold original storytelling, and offers something new to watch every week. Available ad-free and through the platforms you're already on, Shudder. So good, it's scary. Sign up at Shudder.com. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a similar dynamic taking place in the National Security Council because of the usual presence of DOD, plus the presence of so many important civilians who were former military officers, plus the weakness of the State Department, um, which is just extraordinarily weak in this administration. I wonder if there's an especial dominance at the NSC for with a similar dynamic that you just described. 
It's it's really hard to read the pigeon entrails at the NSC right now, in part because there's been so much personnel turnover. Last summer, when the administration was debating its Afghanistan policy or debating the Syria strike, uh, it looked like that dynamic was playing out. Um, but there's been a great deal of house cleaning by H.R. McMaster. Many of the military officers who came in with Mike Flynn are now gone. And you now see uh, the debate that you talk about, I think, the, the disempowered State Department versus the Pentagon, but you also see Mattis and his lieutenants oftentimes arguing for a more empowered State Department because they recognize there's an efficiency in using diplomacy or other tools of power instead of military force, and they also want to free the Pentagon to focus on great power competition and other things that the Pentagon needs to do uh, rather than be the, the force of choice for so many other things around the world. So I, I think we'll have to watch that one closely as it develops in the next year. So speaking of those policy debates, especially on topics like Afghanistan and um, troop levels and, and, and tactics and strategy in Afghanistan, our posture towards North Korea and the like. Reading the newspapers, it seems like that President Trump at times wanted to resist military proposals but ended up acquiescing in them. Can we – is that a fair description of what's going on? Can we read anything from that? Can, can we infer anything from that about the state of military-civilian relations? Yes, we can. And, you know, there's a, a somewhat timeless narrative of civil military relations, the presidency, where the president wants to do something or not do something in some cases. And the Pentagon comes back to him with options. And those options range either from big, medium, and small, or bad to worse, depending on which spectrum you're talking about. And the White House is always frustrated with the options as being too costly, too slow, or too risk averse. Uh, this has been true of the first Gulf War, the Balkans deployments, the second Gulf War, the Afghanistan War, and now Afghanistan and Iraq again. Um, and it was true in the, the world that you and I lived in regarding detainee policy and, and counterterrorism as well. So, so Trump wanted to get out of Afghanistan. It was pretty clear that the instincts he brought were those of his base and a lot of skeptics of American foreign policy over the last 16 years that um, he did not believe the ends uh, justified the, the ways and means. He didn't understand why we still had 10,000 troops there. He didn't feel that aligned with an America first strategy um, and was dissatisfied with the work product that came forward to him. The Pentagon came back with more troops, more plans, more PowerPoint graphics, and it didn't conf didn't didn't persuade him. And there was a famous meeting in July 2017 where this blew up, and he, you know, essentially lambasted the military leadership for two hours in an NSC meeting on why they just didn't understand America's interest in the world. So, Trump is probably sharper in these debates and more pointed in his criticisms of the military, but he is playing a role that I think most recent presidents would recognize and have probably played themselves, which is, I want to do something in the world. I don't understand why the Pentagon thinks it will take five times as many troops and five times as much time as I think it will take. And we're still having that debate, and we'll see how it plays out in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria for the next three years. But I'm just wondering how much that as you say, typical traditional dynamic between the Pentagon and the White House is changed by the fact that the civilian secretary of defense is a former general, the national security advisor is a former general, the chief of staff is a general. I mean, that must inevitably um, impact the president's options. I think it does, to, you know, and, and those officers seem to um, – align a bit more with the Pentagon based on their backgrounds and, and their political preferences that have been stated uh, for publicly for a while. What's interesting is how out of sync they are with their ultimate boss, the president. So it, there's some recent reporting from uh, Greg Jaffe and Missy Ryan of the Washington Post that suggests just how heated these discussions got in the White House about Afghanistan strategy and how McMaster and the Pentagon were essentially on the same sheet of music. They bring these things into the president and he goes ballistic. There's some other reporting that suggests the same on North Korea. And then Mattis, who obviously you know, believes in what he's bringing over, ends up playing the role of translator between the two and soothes the Pentagon and, and McMaster and others to some extent to try to make the relationships work. Trump seems to be the free radical in this ecosystem. He's the one who's not 
accepting the military advice that he's being given by the chairman of the joint staff. He's not finding the options acceptable, and he's not coming to the table with the same ideas about American power and American interests that the last several presidents have had and that the Pentagon is used to. This probably portends a great deal more civil military friction over the course of his tenure, uh, whether the issue is Afghanistan or North Korea or something else we see now, or the next crisis in a place that we don't know about yet. Okay, let's move on to a different topic. I want to talk about two more instances of Trump's norm violations and then look at the bigger picture. The first one is the transgender tweet and what appeared to me like the DOD just basically saying, ignoring the commander in chief and moving on with what they thought the law required. How did you read that? Yeah, so this is a great case study, I think, in, in something you've read, the, the unitary executive or the, the disunitary executive under Trump. Um, and I think we see it on the transgender troop policy and also on the service chief's response to Charlottesville. So President Trump tweets out, I think, in July of last year, uh, three tweets in quick succession that transgender troops will not be allowed in the military. This comes after years of staff work by the Pentagon that essentially had laid the foundation for transgender troops to serve openly alongside uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual troops. And the Pentagon starts by essentially saying, uh, sir, we didn't hear what you said. Can you please clarify? And they, they essentially don't treat the tweet as an order, um, which is a technique, I think, of what I call later respectful disobedience. Um, it's not telling the boss no. It's not telling him, yes, we'll do that right away. It's, it's clarifying things and hoping that a policy process can take root in the interim to make things a little bit better. The other example is what happens after Charlottesville, that there's this conflagration of violence in August of 2017. Uh, Trump infamously comes out and decries violence on both sides, refuses to condemn the instigators as forcefully as he should have. The service chiefs, uh, that is the top generals or admirals of each of the services, immediately come out and on their own tweet or say something very different. The chief of staff of the army, the chief of naval operations, all of them come out and start talking about diversity and respect and the need to make sure there are no races in the ranks. And that contrast really stands out at a time that the senior political ranks of the White House are closing the circle around the president. You have these senior military leaders that are marching to a different beat. And it suggests that the, the service leaders are improvising a new norm of civil military relations, that they absolutely support and will follow the lawful orders of the president, but they will carve out room to disagree with him or to stylistically depart from him in respectful ways. Okay, and finally, before we talk about the bigger picture, how do you see the um, Trump's proposed military parade playing out? How is that? suggestion do you think viewed in the Pentagon? Is this the kind of thing that they will, that the Pentagon will respectfully uh, decline to do? Um, we, I guess we don't know how serious the president is about pushing this. Sometimes he says things and then forgets it. But how, how do you think that played? So, so I think the first response was probably similar to the transgender tweet, which is, excuse me, what, sir? And then when he reiterated, oh, I love the parade that I saw in France. They did it so well. I think they took it seriously and, and probably began to see it as an opportunity both to cultivate their boss and also to show off and maybe get a few recruits along the way, too. So I, I'm told that the planning is pretty far along and that some kind of parade will likely happen um, and that the details are essentially in negotiation right now as to whether it will include tanks or not and how many troops will it include and so forth. You know, look, a, a parade is not a huge deal. If it's done right, it can be a very fun event for all involved, although it's a, certainly a distraction for, for troops from their jobs and from the, the very real things they have to be training for right now. There are broader concerns, though, about this president who has displayed such autocratic tendencies and such a willingness to politicize the military, staging a parade through Washington sends a message to Congress, to the courts, to the press and the people that is, in my opinion, unmistakably autocratic and in some ways undemocratic. And I think we should worry about that. I think we should also worry about what he's going to do at the parade and tweet about it and talk about it, the extent to which he's going to try to leverage this if it happens around the midterm elections for political value. And we have no evidence that President Trump will respect any norms of civil military relations regarding this parade, and I actually think we should think the worst. So let me ask you about – so I, I, it's, I think it's just hard to tell what the longer-term impact of all this stuff will be. I mean I agree with you, and I basically learned from you so much about the various ways and the very subtle impacts of these many norm violations by the president. But the big question is, so what? I mean I, in a, piece, a long piece I wrote for The Atlantic, I suggested that 
future presidents, most of the things that Trump is doing to violate norms, future presidents will not repeat because most of these things have not been in Trump's interest. They're just um, self-aggrandizing impulses that really haven't served him well. Um, I wonder, so all the things you just mentioned might have a bad impact on during this presidency, but how confident are you that this will have longer term, longer term negative impacts? And we can talk about impacts on the military itself, on civilian military relations, on presidential power, on national security more generally. Just take any of those that you like. It's a great question. And, and the, the answer ought to start like all legal answers, which is it depends. I, I think the, the narrowest impact, which will likely outlive President Trump, is this respectful disobedience norm that the service chiefs have begun to embrace. The idea of respectful disobedience and the space the chiefs have carved out to disagree with their president is fine now when we disagree with President Trump and think he ought to be resisted. I worry, though, when we have a different president and he or she orders a different policy that we might not agree so much and we might think the service chiefs need to simply salute and do their jobs. If think back to when Colin Powell was chairman of the Joint Chiefs in 1992 and 1993, and he actively resisted President Clinton, who then wanted to integrate gay and lesbian and bisexual troops into the ranks. In hindsight, that looks incredibly wrongheaded and like Colin Powell was himself on the wrong side of history. But he succeeded because he had also carved out that space to disagree with the president. And, and that norm lived for a little while, and I think it was a bad thing. I think there are probably other instances where the trust uh, diminishment that has occurred between senior military leaders in the White House will take some time to be rebuilt. And then, of course, there are broader the president has done, uh, such as diminished alliances and, and relationships with foreign intelligence agencies. These things will clearly outlive the presidency and, and will need to be rebuilt by the 46th president. Do you think it um, – I mean the thing I worried about worry about is it seems to me – and you're, you're the expert on this – but it seems to me that a lot of these structures we've been talking about are – they're they're pretty deeply embedded in Washington culture, and with that, if and when one has a um, more responsible or more traditional president, we're li they're likely to snap back at least in terms of the traditional back and forth between the Pentagon and the traditional norms that you know get watered down or violated at the margins, but still hold in the core. But I guess I'm wondering about a sort of four four years of this type of behavior and the impact on younger troops who rise up the ranks and maybe don't see these ideals as important and don't internalize them as much is that a, is that a possibility that's a very real concern and and the other concern occurs at the very top end of the military where you will have a cohort that grows up from one to four stars under this president assume he has two terms uh, he will pick the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He will pick the next commanders for all of the combatant commands and all of the services. And those senior officers will come in having been subject to his vetting and his political preferences, and they will learn through trial and error to um, align with this president. And that, I think, will have a lasting effect, too. And by sending the demand signal so clearly to the uh, uniform military that he is, I think he will politicize the senior ranks of the military in ways that are very harmful. How about um, going back to one of the first points we discussed, impact on the effectiveness of the troops at war fighting. Um, I mean, is there anything beyond the you know, risk averseness or cautiousness due to the fact that the president doesn't seem to have the backing of the military? Obviously, that's a big deal. Is there any other potential impact on um, the effectiveness of the troops in, in fighting conflicts? Probably not. And and we can we can say these things rhetorically, but the reality is such a good professionalized military and they're so good at what they do and so committed to their task, particularly when they're deployed, that I don't see a huge direct impact on their readiness or their effectiveness while downrange. Um, that said, if President Trump's not able to marshal the resources to support them because he's at loggerheads with Congress and he creates this gap between what he tells the military to do and what their budgets will support then that will have an effect on the military. Uh, but the budget that just came out of the White House suggests that um, uh, he's at least committing to resourcing them more, if not necessarily fully resourcing the military for what, what they need in this age. That would raise the question, is there any collateral impact of what we're talking about on Congress? Is that relationship affected at all? So, so Congress, I think, is probably in, in the mode of, of stunned prize fighter at this point. They just don't know where to turn next, having been punched so often and so hard, both by this White House and others. <laughs> Congress could choose to engage on war powers issues. It could choose to engage on substantively overseeing uh, the very vast 
machinery of war, but it's instead consumed with Russia and a special counsel investigation and so many other things right now that it, it probably won't get to those debates. There probably needs to be some reconsideration of Congress's role in this space, how Congress relates to the military, how it uses its appropriations power and its authorization power more effectively. But Congress is so busy with other things that it's unlikely to pursue those things uh, this term or probably next term. And finally, and perhaps most speculatively, I wonder if we could just consider, I can imagine future presidents um, taking away one or two lessons from the Trump presidency. One, you could say, well, the taboo on hiring generals for civilian national security positions has been removed by President Trump, and that whatever advantages presidents might see from doing that in terms of just whatever collateral benefits they get, they might be more inclined to do it. Or the taboo, or that's probably too strong a word, but the norm against doing that might solidify in light of the fact that Trump did it and it was seen to be a bad thing. Do you have any predictions about that? So the, the prediction is not so much about whether that norm is violated in the future. I think I think you're right. I think it will be. But I think these things will begin to hurt the military's reputation. Right now, the military enjoys the greatest respect and admiration of any profession. It stands out as one of the most respected institutions in America uh, in survey after survey. And I think as generals take on these very different difficult political roles, uh, like what John Kelly is doing now or what Mike Flynn previously did, and they do badly, that's going to hurt the military in the long run. And they will lose some of their luster in the public, and they will begin to be seen, I think, as um, not just this priestly class of uh, of generals and admirals, but as uh, political operators in their own right. And that will not be good for the military in the long run. That is a discouraging note on which I think we'll end. Phil, thank you so much for the great conversation and the enlightening conversation. Thank you, Jack. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. If you haven't yet, please like the Lawfare Podcast on Facebook, follow it on Twitter, tell your friends about it, and please give it a rating in the iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Until next time, thanks for listening. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device slash service required. Visit at and slash Active Armor for details.